Right, so this is a master's thesis work from uh, Divya Gupta at Virginia Tech, and myself and uh, Dr. Ed Swan were co-advisors in this, in this work. Um, we had a number of other collaborators as well. Uh, and this is the acknowledgement slide, so this is clearly the wrong slide to use. That's what you give at the end, but it looks very similar. It's large and orange. Uh, and what we're going to get at is sort of the effects of both context switching and distance switching uh, in optical see-through AR systems on human performance. And I'm going to define these terms more clearly in a moment. Now, before I get into the details of this talk, I want to know who has tried this hottest new AR display. Okay, two, only two, you got, the rest of you all are missing out. You need to run, check this thing out, because I see most of you have never seen it. That's because it's not the hottest new AR display, I'm sorry. It's uh, actually quite old, like over 14 years old. But this display has a unique, a unique property. The green circle there, the green rectangle, where you can adjust the focal demand of the display. So we talked this morning about, Henry talked this morning about how most displays have these fixed focal distances. This display, you can manually alter that distance. So it's a unique display, and it al allowed us to explore a number of concepts that apply to most displays still today. So even if you don't have this hottest new display, hottest old display, uh, what we're going to talk about today is um, affects most every optical see-through display you have, unless you have some cool one that we haven't heard of yet, which we're going to hear about two of those later on in this session. So just general context setting. As we use AR, and I think Henry laid this out nicely in the keynote this morning, we are simultaneously perceiving both the AR and the real world. And this is especially true in integrated visual tasks, tightly integrated visual tasks. I mean, if you play an AR game, uh, you, you might attend to the graphics more. But there are settings, and some of them important safety critical settings, where attention to detail, fine detail in the real world and the graphics is going to be really important. But we have these fixed focal distances uh, that sort of get in the way. And in fact, what happens ultimately is as you use these displays, you end up accommodating from far distances to near distance to the focal plane of the display, for example, and then maybe back again and back and forth and back and forth. And depending upon the size of that demand, it can be quite fatiguing and cause many other problems that have been noted in the literature. These are just a few. Now, these problems listed here are not in AR. These are in other domains where researchers looked at accommodation and the notion of switching, uh, sorry, uh, accommodating at different depths and the effects. And so what we wanted to do in this research was look specifically at, 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 a, at these same problem in AR. So let me define context switching. The way that we use it in this paper. Essentially, it's the notion of switching your visual attention and a portion of your cognitive attention, your cognitive uh, affordances, switching those from one context to another. And in this simple example, you might have a surgeon that's switching context between a, a patient and some wall-mounted display. I, I purposefully did not use AR in this example. And that this, this notion of switching context between information displays and patients is separate, really, from the distance at which both of those things are placed. Now, in AR, we can think of it, this context switching as moving between the real world and the virtual world, because they are, most of you all have used these displays, right? There's a kind of a qualitatively notable difference in perceiving the real world and the, and the AR. They're not, the AR is not so good that it, it seems like it's the real world. Uh, it, at, even at a physiological level, it's not happening. So we want to look at this notion of context switching when I have to go from graphics to the real world. We wanted to look at these concepts separately, context switching, focal distance switching on human performance, especially when the visual search tasks are tightly coupled. This is our visual search task. It's a simple uh, structured search task where you have a block of text on the left and a block of text on the right. The block of text on the left contains a target letter. You find the target letter by identifying the double letter. Maybe you guys can find the double letter. And then you go to the right block of text and you count the number of times that target occurs. So this is the kind of psychophysical task you do in the lab, right, to understand the underlying phenomenon. Now, once participants did that task, the block on the text on the left would change. You have, so you have a new target to identify. And then you've got to switch back over to the right and count targets again. And we gave participants 25 seconds to identify up to five 
subtasks. So this is important to note that it was a time pressure tasks, task that required switching between two blocks of text. And we could place those blocks of text in different domains. We could put them both in the real world. We could put one in AR, one in the real world, and look at these different things, which is what we did. So when there was no context switching for this work, we defined that as put the left block of text on a monitor, put the right block of text on another monitor. This, is in a, this photograph was taken in a, in a lit setting, but the experiment took place in a dark setting. Uh, and we sort of call this, there's no context switching because we're staying in the real world. I understand that you could argue the monitor is a digital device and maybe that's a virtual thing. We could have printed papers out with text and all that, but we chose to use the monitors as a, as a stand-in for the real world. I think there's arguments to be made that that's fine. When there was context switching, participants had to attend to the AR graphics first in the left block of text and then switch their attention, both visually and cognitively, over to the right block of text which was contained in the real world, that is, on a monitor. So that's the notion of context switching. Now the distance switching is a little bit more complicated, so we've got a few different variables to, to walk through. I apologize for the poor luminance contrast here. So on the bottom we have our monitor where people would attend to real world text, and on the top, for example, we have this virtual text that would need to be attended to. So we encoded, we had three different levels. For all of these variables, we had three different levels. We had a near, a medium, and a far distance of 0.7, 2, and 6 meters, respectively. And we systematically, systematically manipulated all of these variables in this study. So the distance of the real world text is pretty straightforward, right? You move the monitor forward and backwards at these set distances, pretty straightforward. We had three different levels for the focal distance as well. And of course, in the real world setting, the focal distance is perfectly harmoniously matched to the distance to the actual real world object, the, the monitor in this case. But of course, for the monocular head-worn display, the focal distance was changed by that slider I mentioned earlier. And we, we did some calibration with the diaptometer to ensure that uh, we, we could set them at these fixed 0.7, 2, and 6 meter locations. And then lastly, we, we had virtual text. And so we, we drew virtual text the way that we, we all draw virtual text, right? So uh, it had all of the normal properties that you would have in text where if you, if you drew it farther away, right, it got smaller, and you drew it closer, it got bigger. Uh, and so that was controlled simply in the graphics software. Now these, these uh, the text on the, on the monitor actually affords a different set of depth cues, which is kind of of interest here, but not really the main story. Um, there's at least four main depth cues associated with perceiving the text on the monitor in the real world in this, in this particular case. So we're looking in stereo at, at the monitor. So we've got, of course, our binocular disparity. Then, of course, we get the, we get the nice, uh, because of that, we get the nice uh, ability to verge. Uh, and then, of course, in parallax, because we didn't lock our participants into a vice, and uh, size. So kind of basically four cues. But up in this virtual text condition, we have a monocular display. So the, really the only primary depth cues available to participants were motion parallax and the relative size. And of course, the, the accommodative cues. So this is sort of the setup. We measured a number of things. We looked at the number of subtasks completed. Remember, people had up to 25 seconds to do five subtasks. We wanted to see how, you know, how well did they do? Did they miscount the targets, for example? Did they undercount? Did they overcount? And, and they did. They undercounted. Now, every task, which was up to five subtasks, we asked for, uh, participants to self-report an eye fatigue rating. And we did this. This was done quite often. So if you, I forget how many tasks we had in, in, in exactly. It was, it was a while ago. But there was a lot of self-reporting of eye fatigue. And, that, and it's a good thing we did that, because we have some pretty neat sensitive data because of that. And then we asked some questions afterwards. So now we're going to switch to a couple of results. This first set of results is on context switching only. So this subset of data eliminates any, any trials where there's distance switching. There's no, tech, there's no need to accommodate at different distances. You can accommodate to one distance and then switch between contexts. And so you would either be switching between, well, you would either be staying in real to real, which is these light colored bars, and then or be going from the AR to the real which is the darker colored bars. And we found some end effects, uh, mostly, well, all at the far distance. So in short, at six meters, participants completed fewer tasks and were less accurate uh, when context switching. 
Now there's a couple different reasons we think that might have occurred. Uh, we did ensure the text size was larger than the ANSI standard of 22 ArcMin. However, this Nomad monocular display is a retinal, a laser retinal display, and so it had some speckle associated with it, which can make things difficult to read, especially as participants become more fatigued, which was the case. And then there's also kind of an interesting phenomenon where in the real world, right, we have this binocular disparity, which then drives vergence. And then vergence, in turn, helps drive accommodation. In the monocular display, we don't have binocular disparity, so we don't have the, uh, we don't have the advantage of having vergence drive accommodation. And so there was this sort of need to accommodate without those additional vergence and binocular disparity cues. Okay, moving on to fatigue. Not surprisingly, context switching between AR and the real world was more fatiguing for the eye than staying in the real world. And this is, again, this is at shared focal distances. We weren't asking them to accom accommodate at different distances. We just wanted them to switch either from monitor to monitor or from AR to monitor. And the fatigue measures show that participants found task performance fatiguing when the information was in sort of a real, real setting as opposed to the AR view. Okay, now we're gonna go to the focus distance switching, which again has results that you might expect. Um, here we are manipulating all the different distances I showed in the earlier slide. And when we look at task performance, the number of subtasks completed as well as the accuracy, we have main effects. And again, not surprisingly, when you're forced to distance switch, right, you can get less subtasks done and you do them more poorly. And Although this was shown um, in other domains, as I mentioned earlier, we sort of were able to quantify it in this, in, you know, the AR, MR domain. And when we started asking ourselves, well, okay, why were there more errors? What was it about the experimental setup or the stimulus or the hardware that might have caused this? We looked at errors. Where do the errors occur? Now, there were over 9,000 subtasks that participants completed. And about 89% of, of the total errors were undercounts. It kind of makes sense, right? You're, if you're tar counting those targets, you're not going to necessarily, probably not overcount them as much as you might miss one. So as an example, if you find their G here, and then you switch over to the right-hand side, and here you're distance switching and context switching, potentially, you count your Gs. Maybe you get three. Now, in the case where you're switching from AR to the real world and switching distances, your combination is, a combination is occurring as you start to scan this text, is the hypothesis, especially under time pressure. So remember, we said you've got 25 seconds to do up to five subtasks, go, and people were kind of looking back and forth. Now this, this block of text would actually change after a subtask. I, I failed to mention that earlier. So as soon as you complete a subtask, as soon as you hit this block changes, you find the new target, and then you count the, the number of new targets, and you've got up to five shots in 25 seconds. So this is time pressured task. And what we found was that, uh, that the, the hypothesis is, is that users were scanning the text top to bottom, left to right, very quickly because it was time pressured. And since their accommodation mechanism was still at play, they missed target letters in the first line. And this interaction effect sort of backs up that claim that indeed, when there was context switching at play, sorry, focal distance switching at play, uh, most of the targets that were missed were in the first line. Also, throughout the whole experiment, for, for any given individual, for all, in, this is the mean of all individuals, fatigue just kept ramping up and up and up. So this, this, the fact that we're demanding different accommodations and also having them sort of switch context was fatiguing. Okay, so recommendations. These aren't that earth-shattering, but I th I, I'm happy to say that we touched on something that Henry touched on, which sort of you know, makes me feel good inside, right? Uh, so if you're gonna draw text at greater than six meters, you should do probably go a little bit higher than the ANSI standard for now, until our displays get better. If you can, and right now, it's, you can't for most of us, position conformal graphics at depth at the same focal distance as a real-world reference. Now. If you have um, volume swept displays, maybe light fields or other new displays, we can do this. Right now, we have one focal plane, or maybe you have the magic leap and you've got two focal planes, so you can kind of position as close as you can. 
there's an exception to this rule. So in the driving research that our group does with head-up displays uh, and AR windshields, so to speak, there's times you might want to actually put information on a, near, on a near plane, maybe information that's not connected to the real world, per se. Uh, and then that provides, then you're kind of using that accommodative cue in a way that's sort of helpful to the, to the driver or user. Uh, but of course, you put your conformal graphics at distance and match those focal distances. And then in short, if you're engineering a solution here, uh, maybe using a HoloLens or other Magic Leap or other device in engineering or you know, for different use cases or clients, you need to factor in this cost because I think, it, I think it's intuitive that if you distance switch, it's fatiguing and there can be a cost. But this work quantifies a cost to switch in context. So just the mere fact that you're using AR with the real world, it's not seamless yet. It's not one. There's, there's, there's a cost, even at matched uh, focal distances. So I think that's really the, kind of the key takeaway from this. And then lastly, of course, we need to thank our sponsors as well as our other collaborators in this work. And with that, I thank you very much. Great joke, Joe. So, Q&A? Yes, there is already one. Hi. Uh, what was the reason for the visual fatigue when uh, you switched the context when the real and augmented image was on the same distance? Sorry, can you say the, qu can you say the question one more time? I missed the first part. Yes. What was the reason for the visual fatigue when you switched the context between the augmented and the real image uh, when they both were on the same focal distance? Ah, okay. What, what is the explanation for fatigue? Uh, what is the theory at least? F fatigue when um, going, for doing context switching at matched focal di distances. Is that the question? Yes. That's a good question. That, that's, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> there is our best. Our best theory is it's the nature of this particular optical system in the display, uh, which, again, was this laser-based display. And if we had only measured people for a few trials, we might not have seen this effect. And I think also. Um, Since, well, we actually counterbalanced, we counterbalanced the, the two different conditions, so I'm not sure we had a fatigue effect from the other set of trials. Um, we'll, 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 get, this is, we'll get the co-author's perspective on this. Similar effects we found have been reported in the flight simulation community for all sorts of displays. So, it's more complicated than just accommodation. Accommodation is certainly part of it. Right. Thank you. <laughs>